We're going to have several people on the line today, Amy, as we had 30 plus companies register for today's content. So we're excited to see them jumping on now. It's starting to fill up quickly. Folks that are joining on, uh, jumping on, Amy and I are going to get started here in just about 60 seconds. Um, when we start these things, it takes a few moments for everybody to get logged in. So um, we'll get started in about 60 seconds for those that just joined us. I, I hate, Amy, that I'm out here on the beach, you know, and uh, everybody's got to be in Louisville at work, you know. Or wherever yeah, they are in the world. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, Matt. <laughs> yeah. You can't even hear the wind, can you? I'm in a, in a glass box. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I'd love to be on the beach at least for a, a long weekend. That would be pretty awesome right now. Oh man, wouldn't it? It would. Definitely. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and get started. We've got about half of the folks that have registered are already online right here at two o'clock. Thank you, your, uh, your promise is uh, not gone unnoticed and we thank everyone for joining us. So let me make a couple of introductions uh, to today and today's content. Um, we are going to be talking with the expert, which is Amy Ledke from Integrity HR. Uh, and um, she's gonna be talking to us today about motivating and engaging employees in these challenging and changing times. And, you know, although some of this content, um, Amy, that we've got to deliver last week and this week um, never, you know, really goes away, um, it really, um, you know, is really resonating more and more now if we can do just some little things to really kind of keep everybody together, cohesive in the culture, right? So yeah. let me make some introductions on the next slide here. My name is Matt Simons. I'm the VP of Business Development, Oasis Solutions for the Oasis clients that are joining us today. If you haven't met me yet, I've been with Oasis just over six months and have a background in uh, working with different verticals uh, on their ERP integration, business workflow challenges. And I've been doing that since 2015 uh, and really excited to be with Oasis uh, with Annette and Aaron and the team here uh, working with them. And so I want to introduce you though to today's featured speaker on our next slide, which is online with us here. Uh, that's Miss Amy newbanks Letke, and she is going to tell us more about herself, but her and I are just going to have a conversation today. She's going to present some content. I'm going to jump in from here and there uh, with uh, some uh, questions and comments, and uh, hopefully it'll be engaging and a fun time and uh, a good use of everyone's time. So Amy, with that being said, I want you to take over and, and lead the way. Okay, Matt. Well, thanks so much for having me here. It's so great to have those of you who are online. I'm here in my office, unlike Matt on the beach, yeah. just trying to hold the fort down today. And it's, uh, it's, it seems like it's uh, not so rainy at the moment, but uh, we're definitely into fall. So I'm the founder of Integrity HR and work with Oasis as one of our partners. And what we do is we provide outsourced human resources to small and mid-sized firms that want to decentralize HR and have a lot of scalability. So we've been around since 2007 and uh, Lord willing, we'll be around a lot longer. So grateful for my team and grateful to be on today, Matt. So thanks for having me. We've got a lot of topics to talk about. We're going to be looking at sustaining your culture in trying times looking at how do we reset our culture, what do employees really want, <laughs> and looking at how we reinforce some of the right behaviors. I want to give you some examples of those things and uh, summarize today's session. So we're going to try and take you through this in about 50 to 55 minutes, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll keep you on task for sure. Okay, because we know everybody's time is valuable, and we're just so glad that you chose to spend it with us. So... Moving right into this, we're going to be looking at how we can sustain our culture. And, you know, sometimes with our clients, you know, as we're going through uncertainty, and, so, and clearly this year has just been one of the most unusual years in business. And I know that some of my clients just feel like they've been riding a wild stallion just for six months straight. How about you, Matt? Are you hearing that too? Well, you know, absolutely. We're seeing that with people we work with. And it's been obviously weird with the health care restrictions on all of us um, and the go to back work or not and, and that type of thing. But I think more importantly, it's 
it's been eye opening on many uh, fronts. You know, some people that said, you know, that remote work, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll do that a little bit now have had to really embrace that. And with that comes great opportunity and also comes great challenge. Um, and so there's been a balance of both of those. And, you know, I mentioned that I've been with Oasis over six, just over six months. The week I started is when the pandemic hit. And so Aaron Rosenberg and I sat in a conference room with masks on um, doing some initial training. Uh, and then we went online. And, uh, and then everything that we do has been online where typically Oasis would bring content like this to your local, uh, you know, uh, conference center or Copper and Kings or, you know, somewhere that's fun and, and has a, a buffet and a, and a bar. Um, you know, now we're bringing it to you online. So uh, those same challenges obviously resonate in each one of the, the people that are online with us today. Absolutely, absolutely. So when we think about sustaining our culture, this is probably one of the most overarching themes of today's message, and that is really trying to hang on to what you built as a leader and keep engaged with your people. So we're going to be looking at how we treat people and looking at how we preserve our intellectual and human capital, because right now people are so critical to our businesses. We have so many unusual things happening, whether it's with our customers, maybe vendors, partners, but having sustainability and confidence in our people so that they can do their jobs well is something that's gonna help us, I believe, as we grow in the future. And then one of the last things that we're gonna be looking at is how a high impact culture can really improve um, your relationship with your customer and also helps reward and recognize your key people. So these are some things we're going to be taking a look at as we walk through today's session. Now, you know, Matt, one of the things that I'd like for you to maybe take a comment on here is anxiety at work. And this slide I'm going to talk about in a minute, but do you see a lot of people um, either, you know, around Oasis or in your client deck that are kind of struggling with anxiety right now? Yeah, you know, Amy, I think all of us have a certain amount of pride and in social circles, you know, it's, it's hard to come out really and say, I'm struggling with this, right? Mm -hmm. But that being said, I've had several conversations with business leaders, business owners, leaders within businesses, and just employees about their level of stress and anxiety. And, you know, I can speak for myself, you know, as a salesperson, even a, a, an accomplished salesperson who's, who's, you know, had track record, 15, 20 years of success and documented success and all this type of stuff. I'm always paranoid. It's the nature of sales, right? You're paranoid about your job. You got to sell something, you got to make a contact with a key customer and la, 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 la. And, and there's been anxiety and some stress around that, starting a new position, you know, not being able to maneuver in the traditional ways that you would as a, a salesperson, wondering how the company is going to be doing and are, are we going to be employed? And I know we're going to talk about this later, but you asked specifically about Oasis. I think they've done a really good job of communicating with the employees and letting everyone know that, hey, we're in good shape. Uh, we're trending in the right direction. Um, things are going well year over year. Don't worry, you know, be, you know, be as cool as you can be in these times. But it's a real problem and a, and a real deal from from the janitor to the CEO, everyone's feeling some stress at this time. I think you're right. And everybody has some level of anxiety. Um, some people have a lot lower anxiety. Some people manage it very differently than others. And I think the important thing as a leader is to realize that everybody has some level of anxiety and some level of stress. And Depending on how great that is, you might run into things over here on the right-hand side of the screen. And those things are where people just disengage because they can't stay committed and focused. Maybe they just, you know, start feeling burnt out. It, you know, I've had people say, boy, it just feels like Groundhog Day every day. I get up and I do the same thing over and over and over again and nothing changes. And you know, that can cause a lot of stress too. Thinking about watching absenteeism, people leaving, substance abuse accidents. Those are behavioral signs that people are struggling with these two things. Same thing with you know, decision-making, lack of concentration. 
than even physical. We all have heard that stress leads to so many physical problems. And we really have to pay attention to that as leaders within our workplace, because what we can do is sometimes we might actually create anxiety. It might be unintentional, but you know, sometimes we might create anxiety for our employees. We don't even know that we're doing. So we've got to really be mindful that because people have kids at home, people might have parents at home, they might have other family members there, you got kids back from school, and then you've got work, and work might be completely different too. So this is for real. This is where you see anxiety and stress and the results are on the right side of the page. So that's kind of powerful information if we really understand as leaders what that means for employees. Now, if we take a look at this in terms of customers, this is really interesting that anxiety has a direct impact on customer service. So when you take a peek at this slide, you can see that the lower anxiety work environments actually produce higher levels of customer service. So, you know, the goal is to be in the green, right? <laughs> and again, this survey was taken before COVID. So this gives us some really good information, I think, in terms of what steps we can take as leaders to promote a lower anxiety work environment. We're gonna give you some keys to that here in just a minute. Any thoughts about this, Matt? Have you kind of experienced this any in, in some of your dealings recently? Well, you know, I can't remember, I made this comment in our content last week and I don't really think we have any repeat uh, listeners, but I, mean, I can't remember where I stuck this in, but it's important throughout the theme of this. And, it's really kind of serendipity how your content has kind of weaved in with some other content that we've already had in our executive series here at Oasis. And, and, and here's what I mean. We had Amy uh, Rudy on from Impact Sales Systems and she was talking about winning on the hill. And it was great, uh, a great bicycling reference. When you're going downhill, everyone has gravity. As long as you've got decent equipment, you, nobody's really gaining any ground. But when it gets hard and you have to stand up and pedal, that's when you can actually gain ground on your competition. And one way that you gain ground on your competition is by providing exceptional customer service with very few breaks in that service during these trying times. If your clients look at you as a vendor and say, hey, they have continued on and have provided a really sustained level of service for us over this period of time, then you're going to be more entrenched in that business. And I think this is a, a great um, slide to show that, hey, if we can create those low anxiety workplaces, then we are going to be able to maybe not even just keep our customers, but also maybe even gain some ground on the competition who may be failing at this time and not doing as well um, and maybe wasn't as prepared. Yeah, that's a great comment. Well, let's, let's ask our listeners about uh, some of their opinions here, Matt. You want to go ahead and throw a poll out there? Sure. Um, so we've got just three polls today, and one of them is this first one. It says, what do you think is the very best way that we can sustain culture in chaos? Uh, a, should you just push through because change is inevitable, just keeps coming? B, intentionally communicate more to all of your employees? C, focus on check-ins with your employee base? Uh, or D, you know, hold it in and only communicate with your direct reports? If you guys would go ahead and, and launch your poll answers now, uh, that would help us get some feedback here, and the numbers are coming in fast and furious. Um, we'll give that just a few more seconds. There's some big winners uh, on this. I'll go ahead and end the polling for this particular question uh, so we can see the results. And that is a split between B and C, really. It's uh, intentionally communicate more to all uh, and focus on check-ins with the employee base. That's great. So, um, you know, really when we're looking at this, we're going to be taking a look at some leadership behaviors that really help us sustain our culture and chaos. And so for those of you who either answer, communicate more, or really get in touch with your people, so answers two or three, I think you're definitely on the right track. But when we think about what it is that's gonna make the ultimate difference, it is engaging communication. And um, we're gonna get into the specifics from your poll and show you how 
what you responded to really connects in with engaging people. So great job for those of you who answered like you did. When we think about um, what employees want right now, what employees want is a straight shooter. Would you agree with that, Matt? Absolutely. Good or bad, just let, us, let me know where we are as a company and where I stand in that growth or where, what I can do to help cut costs. So, you know, right now there's just so many outside influences, whether it's the upcoming election that's causing people maybe some anxiety and stress, or it could be the protests, it could be just the, the circumstances of being so limited that right now as, as business owners and business leaders, our staff is looking to us to provide consistency and that reliability and to be trustworthy. So we have to be straight shooters thinking about, you know, what's going on in the media and the politics, what we can provide at work is some stability, right? So one of the things that um, I think has been interesting about this pandemic is um, the fact that in looking over historical years where there've been significant in issues that have come up, um, looking at how we have a commitment to ethical business practices and overall fairness in our dealings. And that is one of the things that we're seeing that is absolutely key to helping make a difference. Um, you know, I think during this time, there's always a tendency maybe for people just to, you know, cross that boundary of what's acceptable in terms of business practices to get a deal done. Um, Matt, have you seen that happen in, in your environment? Well, I, I'm going to say, fortunately, no. I haven't seen that happen in my environment. Um, you know, we have uh, maintained those, uh, those ethical standards for sure. But I will say, you know, when you're out there, um, each at bat is so tender now and it's so valuable, right, when you, um, when you get a new potential customer that there's got to be, in some cases, and those competitive nature, um, you know, to, to maybe bend the rules a little bit or over promise and under deliver, which is one of the worst things you can do. Yeah. So that, this is a tendency. I actually talked with some other business owners uh, in one of my round tables that I participate in. And we were talking a little bit about how we've got to really keep an eye on our salespeople. You know, <laughs> that, um, you know, there sometimes a deal at all costs can break every thing down. So being mindful of, you know, the salespeople that you're not incentivizing them to, to do anything that might uh, cross those boundaries during this crazy time would be something to think about. The second item here really goes back to the poll in terms of engaging employees in the process. So, you know, I think sometimes leaders um, want to fix things so quickly. They just find those easy, low-hanging pieces of fruit and just boom, let's knock that out, you know. But during a pandemic, that might not be the best way to handle getting things done because what's happening? People yeah. are, yeah, they're just not, a, not as engaged because of all the distractions, right? Yeah, absolutely. One of the best exercises that we did as a leadership team and a previous employer was each year before our strategic planning session, we did a huge employee survey. And, you know, it was a basic stuff, work environment, uh, direction of the company, benefits, uh, what could you know, have better, what would you like to see? But then there was, you know, how do you think, the, you know, your, what do you think your role is in the company? How do you, can you help uh, expand the company? How can we cut costs? Do you have any ideas? You know, just say we're engaged in the process, then we would display those, they're all anonymous. We display those in the company-wide meeting that came after the strategic planning. So here, we heard you, here's what we're doing, and here's where we're going. And I think that always worked really well because people felt engaged. And our company was about 35 employees. Oh, that's great, that's great. Um, way to stay connected to people and to get feedback before going to such an event like that. So, you know, thinking about how you're intentionally connecting with your people, whether it's daily huddles or maybe you're scheduling one-on-one -on -one time with people or you're working to over-communicate, you know, people have so many distractions now if they're working at home, there's a lot of different things on the table there. So um, be mindful in how you're engaging people. 
Same thing with employee development. You know, this is one of those topics that I probably wouldn't have thought was a big deal right now, but you know, Matt, you and I were talking about taking some time and learning something because good heavens, we can't go to a rock concert or a basketball game right now. So I think maybe you, you actually took advantage of uh, a little bit of employee development during COVID, didn't you? Yeah, well, there were some online companies offering um, what was normally a $350 Excel certification for like $49.99 or whatever, $69.99, whatever it was. So I signed up. It was just a, it was an ad on LinkedIn. I checked it out. It was all legit and, um, and, and took that. And I've completed about half of that. I always wanted to get better at using Excel. And, um, and I thought this was a great time to do that. So That's awesome. You know, it is a, a great thing. There's multiple benefits here for not only the employer, but for the employee. So let's say that, you know, you need some of your staff to step up their skills, maybe in project management. You know, there's plenty of online learning that people can take. You can have some fun with it, maybe some contests, some recognition for learning new skills. And what's interesting to me is that employees really want to step up their skill set, particularly your millennials uh, want to learn more, want to grow. Let's give them a guide. And if they've got some time to be able to work on their own development, whether it's um, for company purposes or just for their own personal development, this can be a real win for us as an employer. So um, take a look at that as an opportunity to differentiate yourself as an employer and be able to help your employees continue to grow during a time where we all just want to go hide in a cave. <laughs> um, and then the last thing here on this slide is really recognizing performance and achievement timely and wow, I think this is super hard. You know, most of my team is working remotely and this is a hard thing to make sure that we recognize people, but we're trying to do that every Monday in our, in our team meetings to stay connected and, and talk about the good things that are going on so that we can kind of keep people moving forward and um, making sure we don't forget that. Uh, I think that would be a component that could really be challenging. Matt, are you doing some interesting things over there at Oasis to uh, recognize performance and achievement? Yeah, so, um, and I'm not even sure, because I wasn't there, but I'm not sure if they had a, you know, a monthly community, uh, company meeting uh, every month uh, before uh, coronavirus, but I know that it has helped since then, every month on about the 15th, there's an employee meeting. Uh, and then during that time, we recognize birthdays and, and achievements and performance. And we talk about sales and we, you know, um, and things like that. Spin the big wheel, right, for prizes. And yeah. I, I just got my $25 Amazon gift card, and went on there and, and blew 25 bucks, you know. And, um, you know, that's, that's great. And, 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 you know, it was my birthday last month. So, uh, you know, you have to participate. And it's kind of kept some culture role and even though online it's kept that fun and and things like that and then our marketing team does a great job too of making sure people's birthdays are posted and you know, happy birthday and and everybody jumps in and, and that type of stuff so that's that's been nice yeah awesome thanks for sharing that so now we got another poll all right here, here you go matt i'm ready so this one says how many of you on our meeting today have short-term plans 90 days or less uh, a, I do, or B, heck no. And we are talking, you know, most people have these strategic plans that are a year, two years long. Does anybody uh, have been working with a 90 day or less strategic plan or a short term plan of some sort? And the answers are rolling in. We'll keep it open uh, for a few more minutes and then we will end it off. Still coming in. It's a tight one. This is a tight one. 90 days or less. All right, here we go. I'm going to share the results. And 56% no, and 44 said I do. Oh, wow. This is really great. Okay, so interesting. So, you know, just a little over half of you say, no, I don't have one, and the others um, do. So let me just tee this up on the next slide because, you know, when we think about leadership, um, you know, a lot of times people talk about just being completely optimistic during a difficult time. But studies show that being realistic and kind of having a plan during hard times is something that's really going to help us sustain moving our businesses forward. 
So for those of you who don't have a plan, I would ask, you know, what are you doing to make sure that you're sustaining this realistic expectation so people know what it is they're working on, what are they working toward? And if you don't have one now, as you go into fourth quarter, you know, we've got more change coming. You know, we've got so many things happening, election, last quarter, last quarter to kind of finish the year out. And then we have a brand new year of 2021 right around the corner. So um, my challenge to those of you who don't have a plan is how are you going to manage that to be able to keep realistic and yet keep some optimism for the future? Right, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. The other piece of this is um, when we think about having plans and moving forward, we have to go back and take a look at some of our old plans. So for example, let's say that we had every year a cost of living increase, or maybe we have pay increases, or maybe we promise bonuses at the end of the year, or Christmas parties, things like that. We might have to go back and really rethink are we going to be able to do the things that we've done before because this year has just been so different? So I'm finding that people are still wanting to maintain the engagement, be realistic in what they can do and optimistic about the future. So Matt, are you seeing any of your clients cut back on some things that I just talked about as a result of the changes this year? Yeah, I've heard a couple of things. So uh, company Christmas party, right? Um, been pretty much nixed across the board from what I've heard. Some companies who have either been maintaining or have had some growth uh, during this time are taking the money they were going to spend on that and divvying it up as part of a, a bonus, right? You know, we usually spend $5,000 on the Christmas party or whatever it is and, and making that a, a small bonus. Um, others um, haven't had as good a year. You know, it's been rough. Um, and I think, you know, I think employees are okay and understand that, but proactive communication uh, that we're not going to have bonuses this year, that we're not going to extend pay increases, you know, at least given a 30, 90 day notice um, is great. And, you know, and I shared with you last time, I had a, an employer not to be named who took a change in ownership always for over 20 plus years had given out a Christmas bonus, right? Um, a ham and a check based on seniority and, and how well you did that year and things like that. Some of the checks were two grand, 2,500 bucks. Some were two or $300. Um, and the new ownership said, no, we're not doing that and didn't want to communicate it. Uh, finally, um, the local CEO communicated it without blessing, but because people depended on that. Some of our employees, that $1,500 or $500 or whatever was their Christmas money or a portion of their Christmas money. And so it was important that they knew that we weren't going to be doing that. And ultimately, we didn't do it the next year, but everyone knew that. And some people were fine with that. Most people were like, you know what? If the new ownership's not going to do it, then we're just not going to do it. I think people understand that this year has been different, but they want to know the truth. Yeah. Absolutely. So we got to we got to be mindful of what the truth is and how we put it out there. So, you know, going back to those 90 day plans, 30 day plans, whatever it is that, that we can see ahead of us, you know, really taking some time to refocus our culture on service and commitment and putting that plan together. And then we have to really make sure we tell people. And Matt, do you remember what that magic number is of how many times we have to tell someone something? <laughs> Seven. Great. You remembered. So yeah. And so sometimes it's so hard for us as leaders because we've, we've got the message in our mind. We want to get it out. We think, okay, well, how many times do I have to say this? Well, <laughs> seven. <laughs> you know? So it is a little tricky, but making sure we do refocus this and communicate it really clearly. Um, also making sure we look at training education opportunities. This might be a way during COVID where you can cross train people, getting people um, ready and prepared for new opportunities. Um, Matt, you gave us some great ideas about some incentives for good performance. Maybe there's a way that you can have um, some kind of things, whether it's uh, celebrations or you know, I know one of my clients sent food to everybody's house. It was a smaller employer. So they had, hey, have lunch on me since we're not having lunch together. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, we even talked about um, really looking at um, how are we reaching out to our employees at home, maybe sending them things since you're not coming back into the office. And then for those of you who are in the office, how do you, you know, share and celebrate? 
And then also providing some, some good examples of good customer service. So during this time, it's, it's, you know, taking care of customers might be a little bit different than what it has looked like in the, in the past. So making sure that we give those good examples of and, and recognition when someone does a great job taking care of a customer. Some of the other things that we might want to think about is, um, you know, engaging our employees. I mentioned daily huddles. You know, this is kind of what's old is new. I remember when I was first getting started in human resources, I came up through the um, production environment. And uh, one of the things we had ingrained in us was the Toyota production system. And so every day we had our daily huddles and get out there on the production floor 15 minutes, just talking about, hey, what do we have to do today? What's the goal? Who needs help? What kind of parts do we need? You know, what does success look like? And boom, we went off uh, and took care of what we needed to do. So um, now what we're finding and what research is sharing, especially Harvard Business Review, is that the daily huddle is back. So if you can give 15 minutes for your people to get them going, you're gonna get a lot more out of them. What do you think about that, Matt? Well, I think one thing, important thing to remember there is that if you set it to be 15 minutes, keep it at 15 minutes. Yep. Um, people don't want a daily gripe session, a daily, um, you know, um, Bob always takes over the meeting and, and, and talks the whole time. You know, just have, have an agenda, have an action items, keep it quick, keep it light. Are there any roadblocks? How can I help? Um, you know, what do we need to get done today? Any new communication information, that type of stuff, four or five bullet points, keep it at 15 minutes, keep it at 30 minutes, whatever you set and move on. Yeah, absolutely. Keep it focused and keep it short. Same thing with, you know, having weekly communication meetings with your employees. Some of our clients are texting to stay in touch as well. So, you know, kind of the you've got the video meeting and then you have some video fatigue. And so let's just get on a call or let me check in with you by text. So, um, you know, those are all things that are tools, just remembering that we, we have to be very mindful to reach out to people. And, you know, employees also want to know how to fix things. They want to see how our leaders do it. So, you know, if there's something that you can share with your employees right now on how to perform their jobs better, this is a really good time to do that. Now, we had a poll earlier on chaos and employee engagement, right? And so we're talking more about communication, whether it's one-on-one -on -one focus groups or some other matter. But, you know, one of the things that we know when we're in a chaotic situation is taking care of employees. And that's where Matt and I were, you and I were talking earlier about um, being, you know, very realistic with our employees, yet trying to continue with some optimism, right? Because this is what we're not getting in the media, not getting um, when we're going home necessarily now. Maybe you've got a really awesome family that, you know, kind of helps keep things moving. But the, kind of the rest of the world, we're not seeing a whole lot of that. So one of the things we can do to survive in the long run is make sure we energize our employees. So making sure they know what the mission is, what's the task for the day, what's the task for the week, where are we going? and um, how to achieve it's really critical. Now, I know um, you also have a mission statement over at Oasis, right, Matt? So you're kind of mission, vision, values driven over, over there, aren't you? Oh yeah, for sure, absolutely. And I've even taken part of that and adopted it to my own LinkedIn profile. I love one of the lines in there is, we strive to be an innovator at the intersection of software and people. Right. And so, you know, take the people and software and we, we strive to, to be an innovator. So I've, I've put that as my LinkedIn tag. In, you know, what do I do? Well, I'm an innovator at the uh, intersection of software and people. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I told you last time we, we did this, I haven't hardly worked a day in my life since 2008. And that's when I um, started working for companies that kept employee engagement very high. You know, the days were short. There wasn't enough time in the day. Um, I did work after hours because I was engaged with it. I cared about it. I told people about what I did. The sales was easy because I wanted to share what we were up to and how we could help the customer and the problems that we solved. And did they have those problems and that type of stuff, right? And so I love this statement here, you know, that, um, 
you can't run without energized employees who believe in the mission and understand how to achieve it where they fit in it. Really love that. That's really, you know, uh, played out in my life. Yeah, that's great. That's super great message, man. You know, I've got ours back here. We've got our, our company core values are over here, even though we're not all here together. We've got them posted all over the office building and we send them out in our presentations and we talk about being trustworthy, professional, positive, can do, organized and compassionate and caring. And boy, those two words go a long way right now. <laughs> you know, it's all pre-COVID when we came up with that, but I think that's a key as well to taking care of our people. And you know, if we do engage people, we are going to have higher rates of employee retention. We don't see a lot of people making movement right now, but people are willing. So you do have employers who are hiring right now. And if you've got intellectual capital, but you don't want to go out the door, this is a big deal for us as leaders. We can also expect better collaboration, better customer interaction and satisfaction. And then we're going to see some of that correlate to our bottom line results. And it's really data driven. You know, Gallup produces these polls every year relative to employee engagement. And I was fascinated by, you know, the research that they have done, which got me excited about, you know, pulling all this information into our clients so that we can help them survey their employees and take the power of employee engagement to help make their businesses stronger. So you can see that, you know, based on their data, you know, engaged employers report 22% higher productivity. So yeah. that's astounding, isn't it? Well, you know, and I don't think there's that data could be higher in certain cases. Obviously that's an average, but yeah. you know, one thing that uh, this is several companies ago with one of the first jobs I, that I worked, that I really loved, um, one thing they did for engagement is they had this disconnect between service and sales, right? Sales would sell the stuff and service would be like, ah, oh, sales is always, oh, uh, and the service guys all had the technical knowledge and the sales guys had more of the people skills. Well, we started doing twice monthly meetings together, training, mm -hmm. like two hours of training with service and sales, service lead sometimes, sales would lead sometimes, different topics. And it really created this engagement, this cohesion. And then all those, um, you know, complain sessions kind of went, a lot lower and there was a, and then the sales were more um profitable because sales wasn't over promising or promising things that were eh, you know yeah we sort of do that they understood exactly you know what service did and then service was more in tune with what the messaging was out in the the marketplace and uh and they became more profitable and so i yeah i totally agree with that stat so it's, it creates a huge opportunity for us when we think about our businesses and knowing that there's real data to support this. You know, sometimes I think it's easy to say, well, you know, I don't know that I necessarily want to put time and effort into all those activities. Well, the reality is, is if we do, we're going to have some kind of payoff, but it needs to be measured and it needs to be really intentional. So let's take a look at what leads to this improvement. And this is where, you know, getting people excited, having them, you know, really focused. This is kind of what it looks like, you know, the degree of which what employees do to connect to their work and feel committed. So when we do these kinds of, we see these kinds of things happening, we know that these behaviors are really reinforcing what we're wanting to see happen with engagement. And I'm going to talk a minute about how do we measure that. But, you know, one of the things we have to be really careful of is, you know, you can't really get to engaged employees if we don't have a few basics met. Right, Matt? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, like you've got here the Maslow pyramid, right? I mean, if you don't know where, you know, next week's groceries are coming from or don't feel safe or belong, you know, part of the culture type of thing, then you can't get to those higher levels of, of employee engagement, uh, like self-esteem and, and, and ultimately in Maslow's uh, pyramid, self-actualization, which is really what I think people would say today, living your best life, right? You know, how are you doing? I'm living my best life. Great. You know? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, I think as a savvy leader, we have to recognize that you know, paying attention to the physiological needs, even safety, you know, coming into work, driving home, if people are working in areas where there's protests that may cause more stress. So 
you know, when people don't have physiological needs met or safety needs met, then you've got this love and belonging. Well, belonging starts with engagement, right? That gets people really connected. And that's when you can start maximizing it. So just really recognize when you're, you're really savvy and astute, knowing that those physiological needs and safety, when those things are met, people aren't stressing out about them so they can really start feeling more connected. Now, the ways a lot of employers are finding out engagement, because you have to measure it some way, right, is typically through opinion surveys, engagement surveys, um, maybe some assessments or focus groups where you're sitting down and talking with your employees about very specific things, all employee meetings, and then of course, focusing on wellness. And you know, I had a, I had a question uh, just last week about uh, is, an EAP, the best thing we can do right now, well, I think having an employee assistance program or an EAP is a great thing to do, but we also have to focus on people's wellness. And, and this is a great way to engage people because you know people are heading out to the forest, going hiking, doing other things, but that can also help them be engaged at work too. Yeah, I mean, all of us have a device now, whether it be a phone, a watch, a Fitbit or whatever, um, have access to devices, let's put it that way. Um, if we are a person that is focused on wellness, um, I think the employer should encourage that. You could have competitions, you can have, uh, you know, employee organized biggest loser type contests or most steps or uh, steps chart, uh, that type of thing. And that usually helps you get a, a decrease on your uh, health benefits as well. If you can prove those out, I think wellness is, is great. That All the others are, are necessary on the list. But I love, I love wellness. And I also had a guy tell me one time, Amy, I thought this was funny, and I've seen it go both ways at various companies. You want to find out how engaged your employees are, have an employee uh, picnic on a Saturday when it's off of work hours, not during the day where, you know, and see how many people sh actually show up, and that's kind of how engaged it is. Uh, and I've had companies where it's been packed, like almost everybody was there, and we, we threw Frisbee, and we grilled out, and blah, 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 and laughed and played guitar and whatever. And then I've had other ones where it was like four of us out of, you know, 40 employees. And uh, it was kind of sad. It was like the organizers of the picnic. So um, I always just thought that was funny. You want to find out how engaged your employees are, have a picnic on a Saturday and see who shows up. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you might actually have more engaged people now because the ones who want to get out and do something will definitely show up. Yeah, no doubt. But, yeah, who's to say at this point? So... You know, again, we got another poll real quickly here, Matt. Last one, last yeah, one. Yeah, and then we're going to really get into our final rundown. So okay. let's take a so, look. So here you go, folks. Would you agree that now is the time to be asking basic questions about safety, security, self-care, and, and what do employees need to be more effective at work? Oh, yes? Nah. Would you agree that now is the time to be asking some of those basic questions about safety, security, self-care, and what do employees need to be more effective at work? We've got several answers that have rolled in. And this one, Amy, I think we gave it away. This one's a landslide. <laughs> You're uh, paying attention. Yay! That's right. <laughs> and so I'm going to share the results. And out of the, uh, the, the folks that did get a chance to respond, oh, yes, was the big answer. Great. Well, Thank you for doing the poll there, Matt. I think that's great. And those of you who are asking those questions are going to be having an edge on other employers. So let's quickly go through nine steps that are going to help you increase your competitive edge with engaging your employees right now and as you go forward. So number one, and I want you to self-assess. So I want you to kind of take some notes right now on where you are and where you'd like to be. So when you leave today's session, you can kind of reflect on that and think about anything that you might like to implement. But First of all, we have to kind of look inward at our culture and really look at ourselves as leaders. You know, what is our culture like today? Are people afraid? Are people engaged? Do we need to measure what our culture is so that we can solidify it and have everybody better aligned? So think about if you believe your people are your greatest asset. If no, why not? And is that holding you back right now? So Number one, taking a look at this. Now, number two is committing to developing people. And when you've got good HR processes, it's going to help take care of your business. So we want to look at our teams, our individuals, the talent, 
is our competitive advantage, I believe, clearly for my business, for professional services, that's what we have. Uh, and I think that having talent in many organizations, probably every organization, is what is going to separate us from our competitors overall. What do you think about that, Matt? Well, I'm totally that, you know, and this happens if this is anybody's environment at your office. Take this as a uh, half of a joke here. But, you know, some organizations I've worked in, uh, I've had the, the lady who was a bookkeeper, HR director, and, you know, part-time custodian. And it's like, that was the focus on HR was like just enough to be compliant, make sure the paperwork was filled out and none of these extra things that HR does provide. And and that's unfortunate sometimes, you know, I mean, we do have to wear many hats a lot of times as leaders. I get that, but that investment in, um, in your people with, with a, with a good HR is great. And then I thought about your first one real quick. Someone told me one time when you're looking at your culture inward, um, think about being visited by the ghost of culture past, culture present, and culture future, right? And so it, it, it can help you to put it in perspective, like where have we been? Was that great? And now we're kind of, uh, or was that bad? And we're getting better or, you know, and then where do we want to go with that? And what are some, some small things that we could do, uh, when it, whether it's wellness or volunteering or employee surveys or whatever it is to really help people get engaged in that process? Uh, that's a great analogy. I'm going to use that around Christmas time, you know, or maybe Halloween <laughs> time, even better. <laughs> right. That's right. So you kind of led into this one, Matt, and I appreciate that, is making sure we got the right person in the right leadership position and, you know, making sure that in general we've got the right people in the right spots. So if we've got someone, you know, wearing multiple hats who's not doing very well, are we really having that person serve the organization in the best possible way? So really assessing your talent, making sure during this time people are able to sustain what's being expected. And you might need to make some changes. It might be an opportunity to promote some people up. It might be able to, you know, take a look at that good, bad, and ugly of what's going on. Hopefully there's a lot more good, but we've got to take a look at job performance, making sure that we are getting the right people into the right positions. So now's a good time to really reposition. And I think the the new word, you know, we talked about earlier is pivot, right, Matt? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta be able to pivot. Yeah. So if you're like a cruise ship trying to make a left turn, that's a bad <laughs> position to be in right now. Right. And so we want to make sure that we are measured about that. But let's not hide from the truth. Let's stay as focused as we can to be able to deal with these things and not think, oh, well, I'm just going to deal with that later. We'll get over the pandemic and we'll, we'll deal with it later. No, it's, no, don't, don't wait to address great performance average or poor. The other thing is to think about how we're developing our management styles to fit your people. So, you know, we've got diverse workforces, you know, different ages, different experiences, different backgrounds, you know, different colors, religions, you name it. We've got all kinds of different things going on right now, but we have to work on developing our managers to be able to do a great job with that. You know, I like training with the DISC profile, you know, some kind of an instrument to help people understand a little bit more about how they behave and how their behavior impacts others and why they work better with some people than others. You know, this is always interesting and introspective. So doing something like that, if you can have something fun and engaging to help people learn how to better work together when it's a stressful time, this might be to your benefit as well. So taking a look at how you can develop those styles so your managers are gaining greater expertise. Number six on the list of nine is understanding your target employees. You know, organizations are very successful typically at understanding who their target customer is. Would you agree with that, Matt? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's (laughs) kind of the whole thing that, that we do, right? In sales, at least. Yeah, you spend a lot of time figuring out who your target customer is. Well, how much time do we figure out what our target employee looks like? Interesting, yeah. I want you to kind of think about that because we get employees into our organizations. Hopefully, they're going to come and stay a while, just like what we want our customers to do, right? But we've got to have some good data analytics to make sure that we're bringing the right people in. So 
one of the things I'd encourage you to do now is if you're hiring or you plan to hire people, taking a look at what's made some of your employees more successful. It's a time where you can use some science and technology and data to really find the next target person. So using assessments, doing some benchmarking, finding out from your employees what's made them more successful on the job can help lead to a much better hire. So, you know, I'd encourage you to take a look at how much time you spent on identifying that target customer, you know, knowing what that is. And if you can correlate that to your employees, it's going to be a great way to start engaging people from the onset of employment. Okay, number seven, develop employees' people skills, right? <laughs> be patient, CEO. Not everybody is going to have the greatest people skills all the time. They might be impatient. They might be frustrated. They might be tired of teaching their kids from home, right? So we need to be patient in how we're developing the people skills of the folks that we have with us. You know, giving feedback, praising general, generously, um, coaching people on what is a good thing to continue to encourage. So being patient while people develop these, but putting a plan together can be very effective. Matt, have you seen any of your clients doing some of this to, to encourage greater abilities with using their people skills? Yeah, you know, I've, I've seen it uh, in my own work life, not uh, specifically at Oasis right now, but in the previous position, um, to, you're both six and seven was the same person. This person came in for an inside sales, which is usually an entry level with, with the particular company I was at. Um, wasn't really dressed uh, for the interview, I didn't think, and didn't have really the greatest people skills. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, the job market was hot. And so we said, you know what, we're going to give this person a chance. But I'm glad we did because that person became one of our most successful inside sales reps. And in fact, with like a $24,000 base, first year made $100,000. Wow. So it was all commissioned, right? And yeah. then what we started to do, that person's uh, we started to pour into that person with some of these people skills, this inner office stuff and some, and some phone stuff and some etiquette stuff. And then this person became the trainer of that. And then we also did what you said. We weren't using any analytics to hire at that time. We were just saying, you know what, we, we need a couple bodies, you know, we've got four people, let's choose these two type of thing. Then we started using analytics. And what we did was for the inside sales rep, as we, we, we put her through uh, the DISC type of assessment, I don't know if it was DISC or, or similar, and saw what her strong traits were and then looked for those and any of the other applicants that came in. Because you could put a contest and say, I bet you can't make 100 calls a day every day this week, and she was going to do it. You could put a $10 gift card for making a sale in a day, and she was going to get two of them, you know? And it was this competitive thing uh, with this employee who was great, but didn't come in with it. We had to invest in this person. Uh, and then they, by the time they left, in fact, they own their own business now. I've, I've tried to get that person to come work for me in other uh, uh, situations. She was like, no, Matt, I really enjoyed working with you, but I'm doing my own thing. See you That's later. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, thanks for sharing that because that kind of insight, it can be very helpful for our listeners, I hope. So number eight, make sure that you've got your employees in a solid job fit. We talked about that, getting right people in the right seat, kind of like the good to great book from way back when. So making sure that we know that it's all about job fit. You know, you can hire for behavior, you can train people those skills, just getting people in the right place at the right time. And then lastly, understand what your employees are experiencing. And just, you know, there's a lot of distractions right now. But when we think about branding, finding out what's going on uh, with our employees, listen, show compassion right now, give people stability and find ways to build trust. It's gonna help you with your edge. And then the last area here is providing hope because right now people are looking for something to believe in. And it can be you as a leader, a manager, a mentor to your team. So remember, these are the leadership traits right now. We started them with them, Matt, we talked about them, but keeping focused on ethical business practices and fairness, fairness and equity, employees are looking for that. And really thinking strategically about employees, looking at development, recognition, and showing that compassion and empathy. And why is that important when we talk about fairness? Well, 
Fairness translates into honesty, consistency, credibility, and trust. So as a leader, this is what employees want most of, and this is based on a survey that was taken a few years ago, but fairness, and this is what we can provide during the midst of a, a pandemic. So quickly as we're wrapping up today, you can improve your retention in this tough economy by communicating. So back to our first poll, Matt, you know what people said, yeah. uh, communicating a lot, showing compassion because your employees are gonna be going through a lot more now than they have prior to COVID just from a standpoint of major massive change in our entire lifestyle. So fostering adaptation, being honest and proactivity about our health and our finances our business plans, uh, keeping a communication plan, weekly, daily huddles, those kinds of things. Ask people for ideas, whether it's cost savings or business improvement, they're, they may be full of ideas. So again, getting people engaged, strive to get the current culture, have high impact touches. This is gonna go a long way. And then just think about this, embracing disequilibrium. This is one of those things that, you know, just this whole, what isn't normal is probably something that we've got to figure out how to get better at dealing with, right? Because boy, boom, March hit and it was crazy and it has been for some time. So it's probably going to continue at least through the beginning of next year. And then focusing on achievement and generating your leaders. So don't forget this as we get ready to close the session today, making sure that you're taking care of you. So many times leaders are focused on just caring for others and not really thinking about themselves. But if you don't take time to take care of yourself, then none of this is really going to get very far. So keep in mind the practice of self-care, number seven on my list, going to go back to number one. It really does start with you taking care of your employees like family, being compassionate, and they will treat others the same. Use those surveys that Matt and I talked about to be able to gain an understanding about how people are engaged and make some improvements. Take a look at your A players. We all have A, Bs, and Cs in our organizations, but during this time, sometimes it's those C players that take up all the time. Make sure you're paying attention to your A players and nurturing up those Bs. And then don't forget to support those right behaviors and engage your workforce, which will ultimately help sustain your corporate culture. So if you'd like a complimentary best practices and culture assessment, feel free to talk to me after the session. I'll help you identify other areas of sustainability and turnover mitigation. And if it's not a great 30 minutes, I will buy you lunch. How's that, Matt? That sounds great. That's awesome. What a deal, right? And I'll tell you, there is um, two things that we'd like you to do, participants, and everybody's still on the line, so thanks for sticking around. Uh, one, go to the chat and provide us your one takeaway in the chat. Provide something that you, uh, that you saw or that you heard that you thought, ah, pretty good. And then number two, we've got a survey that's going to pop up uh, here at the end, and we would love to hear your feedback about the presentation today so that we can uh, keep to, uh, you know, sanding down this content and making it applicable to our audiences. So if you, if you would take the time to take that, it won't take two minutes, that'd be great. And we really appreciate everybody that joined us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today, Matt. It's been amazing to be with you and the Oasis team. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. We got the, uh, the takeaways coming in on the uh, on the chat, so I appreciate that. And then we'll have a survey that's going to pop up here uh, in just a moment. So thank you all for joining Amy and I today. Our contact information is on the screen. And uh, with that being said, I guess we will see you next time. Uh, and hopefully that will be really soon. Amy, can't wait to see you again and hear some more uh, of this stuff. Some of my favorite stuff to listen to. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much, Matt. You all take care and thanks for joining us on today's session. All right. Goodbye. Bye, Matt. Take care.